Europe has lived behind America's nuclear apron strings for decades. Perhaps it's time to grow up and face the reality of the usefulness of nuclear weapons. For the moment, it's Britain and France whose fingers are on the nuclear button. But a Euro nuke? So, can a cosseted Europe even decide on a nuclear weapons policy? Join me, Jan Darash, for how we got here. The geopolitical realities of the post-World War II world were defined by one major factor, a nuclear arms race between the Soviets and the Americans. In a world where two largest superpowers began to amass weapons of massive destruction on a scale previously unheard of, other powerful nations quickly elected not to be dependent on fate alone, and two started their own nuclear programs, with the vision of securing their own nuclear arsenals. The goal was never to use them, but rather only possess them and let their presence act as deterrents. As a result, throughout the second part of the 20th century, the world's leading powers continued producing nuclear warheads, without considering the possible consequences of creating a geopolitical reality where the planet's total annihilation is not only an achievable feat, but a genuine threat. According to experts, the current global arms control regime is in disarray. Treaties that were once the pillars of ensuring global security have collapsed due to geopolitical tensions. These treaties were primarily between the US and the Soviet Union and then the US and Russia. Together, they reduced the global nuclear stockpile from 70,400 warheads in 1986 to about 12,500 today. Combined, the US and Russia account for 88% of the world's total inventory of nuclear weapons. At present, nine countries are known nuclear weapon powers. The US, Russia, China, France, the UK, India, Pakistan, Israel and North Korea. Iran is reportedly close to joining the group. Our guest today is Artur Kacprzyk. He's an international security analyst at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Welcome to the program. Good evening. Thanks for having me. It's great to, great to have you. Uh, we'll start off with the paper you wrote recently about the European uh, uh, nuclear project, nuclear weapons policy. Can you summarize what you wrote? Very interesting paper. Can you summarize what your, uh, how you, your main points and your conclusions that you wrote? Uh, so I, I basically refer to the uh, start with referring to the debate which heated up recently in Europe, mostly in Germany, uh, at the begin at the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024, uh, the debate about whether uh, Europe should uh, develop some kind of its own independent nuclear deterrent, independent from the United States. And this debate has been going on in Germany for quite some time, since 2016 actually, but it has been reinvigorated recently uh, due to upcoming US elections, due to, uh, of course, Russian nuclear threats accompanying the war against Ukraine. But I, I would say that the upcoming US election and the, uh, the possibility of Donald Trump winning presidency again is the main factor uh, in, in reinvigorating this debate. And recently we've heard the statements from Trump that he repeated his statements that he wouldn't defend um, as a US president countries uh, of NATO which do not um, fulfill their financial commitments. Uh, so th this all cre creates a lot of unease uh, in German public space. Uh, but uh, the debate didn't really arrive at, didn't lead to any change of um, policy, actually, of Germany. Uh, how, and do you how do you explain that, by the way? That we have a threat from the East, um, a fear, as you, as you said earlier, uh, about uh, the impending election of, or the possible election of President Trump, and Germany seems to vacillate between the two or be uncertain about its policy. How can you explain that? I, I think this goes to the uh, one of the main conclusions of my paper, about which you ask, is that uh, simply Europe would not be able to quickly uh, provide as credible nuclear deterrent as the US provides now, at least in a military sense. Uh, so I, what I would say, and also some of German politicians uh, say quite loudly, uh, is that we should focus first and foremost on 
uh, contributing more to burden sharing within NATO, first of all to improve our own European security, mm -hmm. but also basically not to give Trump or any other US politicians reasons or excuses to withdraw from NATO or re reduce their commitment uh, to NATO. So we should first and foremost invest in conventional forces. And as regards nuclear forces, uh, first of all, the idea of having some kind of joint EU nuclear force is, is for many reasons, including political ones, simply unrealistic. Neither France is not going to share the decision making over its, its nuclear deterrent with, uh, with other countries. Uh, and then there's the limit of, of size, uh, the limiting factor of size of, of nuclear forces. US has almost 4,000 nuclear warheads, half of them could be used relatively quickly. Uh, and they, they could be used against, to, to respond to a Russian attack, to many attacks to get against many adversaries around the world. But still, uh, European nuclear arsenals are much smaller and their main task uh, is to defend, uh, to, to respond massively to an attack on, 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 the, on the countries which has them. So th there are two countries, France, uh, around 300 nuclear warheads and the United Kingdom up to, to, to 160 nuclear warheads. And even if they wanted to increase those arsenals, uh, it couldn't be done quickly. There is a there is a limited capacity in those countries to produce nuclear weapons. But you you advocated the the, the idea of a euro nuclear sharing policy, um, and yet at the same time you seem to be saying it's unreasonable. No, uh, I, what I'm well, what not I, unreasonable, what, unrealistic. What I am advocating is something different. Uh, I am advocating for European allies to have uh, to contribute more to nuclear sharing within with the United States. Okay. which is something different because the United States uh, deploys right now around uh, an estimated 100 nuclear bombs in Europe uh, and these countries are widely known, countries which host those weapons are wi widely known to be Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Italy and Turkey. Uh, and if the US uh, president allows in wartime uh, the aircraft the air forces of those countries could use those weapons. And this is something way different than the idea of a joint uh, nuclear deterrent, a joint European nuclear deterrent, which would mean in practice either, you know, having some kind of supranational body in the EU yes. that would decide on the use of nuclear weapons, which is not going to happen because I, I think... 27 we, fingers on one button is... A... So one idea would be some kind of federal government, which, is, which we are not going to have anytime soon in the EU. The other idea would be to have 27 uh, countries uh, agreeing to that, which would not be a credible solution because you know, the, the more fingers on the trigger, the less likely than somebody yes. would, would veto the use of that. And by the way, in the EU, we have... Uh, countries with very different views of nuclear weapons, including not just France and nuclear power, but on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have Austria, Ireland and Malta, which signed a treaty banning nuclear weapons. Uh, and according to this treaty, nuclear deterrence is not only immoral, but illegal. So EU is not, uh, for various reasons, not the right forum to discuss European you know, contribution to nuclear uh, deterrent. On a practical level, you say that these uh, nuclear weapons are based in chiefly in Western Europe and Turkey. How does that work in, in cases of uh, an, in an, an imminent uh, threat? Uh, you say that the, does, does this mean that the US has signed a blank check to these countries and if, say, Germany were felt, felt to be threatened, could it immediately um, send these weapons into the con uh, conflict zone? How, d how does that, does it have a, no, it's not, is, is there a, uh, a conference between the, the two staffs? It's not, the it's staffs? not automatic mm -hmm. uh, because again, these are US nuclear weapons and this is something different than this idea of joint nuclear deterrent in which you would have some really multilateral joint you know, force. Here you have US nuclear weapon and the, the other country providing the aircraft to deliver it. And it's, uh, 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 both sides have to agree to that. But of course, the, the key thing is that the US president would have to agree to let that country to use a nuclear weapon. So there's nothing automatic. Now, in addition to that, formally, it's a uh, bilateral 
uh, decision between the US and you know, Germany or any other uh, other country. But then again, this is um, uh, this, this this nuclear sharing and the weapons, US weapons deployed in Europe and allied contributions to, to, to deliver of these weapons. This is all jointly managed in NATO. So uh, in NATO, uh, we have uh, joint planning on how to use those weapons. Yeah. Uh, other countries could provide support for a possible nuclear mission, meaning that, for example, Poland could send its own fighters to escort those, the other aircraft that would be carrying US nuclear bombs. So theoretically, it's a bilateral decision to use them. But uh, then again, you have this, uh, this, this um, joint planning, joint consultation about their use in NATO. And this is, uh, as you as you know, the 27 fingers on the trigger uh, in the EU would lower the credibility of a joint EU, uh, EU nuclear deterrent. Uh, some would argue that with 32 countries in NATO also, uh, uh, yes. there's a limited credibility as to what you know, we could all agree in a conflict to, 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 to use those weapons. But again, uh, NATO, uh, this, this joint management in NATO is about consultation. US can consult its allies on nuclear use and still use its own nuclear weapons yeah. regardless of what I mean, they say, similarly to, within, to those in Europe. Within that framework, does it make sense that Poland has these uh, nuclear weapons on its soil? It would make sense for Poland to have a nuclear, US nuclear weapons on its soil. Uh, first of all, placing them in Poland or any other eastern flank country uh, would send a, a clear signal to the Russians of our resolve, uh, because you know NATO is modernizing its nuclear forces as are, as are you know all NATO countries. Uh, yet we are self-restraining ourselves. We are not deploying new nuclear weapons to Europe, new, new means of their delivery, whereas Russians are constantly uh, developing new kinds of missiles. Now they have announced that they, they are deploying nukes in uh, Belarus, actually. And yes, and in Kaliningrad as well, there are rumours at least of... Uh, yes, they have at least nuclear capable forces and storage sites in Kaliningrad for a long time. And maybe the warheads are there, maybe they are not. They could be there quickly anyway. Uh, so I think uh, there, is, there is more that NATO collectively could do to show that it's not as um, sensitive about nuclear weapons as escalation, and escalation as, as Russians might think. They clearly did think at the beginning of the attack against Ukraine that with their nuclear signals and threats, uh, they can uh, intimidate the West not to provide Ukraine yes. with, with, with military assistance. To some extent, uh, to great extent, it didn't work because we've provided Ukraine with so much material, but to some extent it still works. I mean, Germany is not sending its uh, Taurus cruise missiles to Ukraine out of fear of escalation with Russia. And there are a couple yes. of more instances it's, of it's that. A, it's a strange thing to, to fear an escalation of a war which is already escalating Almost, not necessarily out of control, but to, a, to a, we're almost at a pre-conflict, pre-boots on the ground conflict with Russia. I mean, why are we so afraid of? Uh, why do we, re, uh, as in Western Europe, why do we repeat the fear of escalation? We're already in a major conflict with Russia, except we don't have any troops there on the ground. You know, obviously, when confronting a nuclear armed advers adversary, you have to weigh risks. But uh, there is, I, I would say, and you know, you don't approach these things, these matters of escalation and so on, lightly. But there is too much concern, I think, in, in uh, especially in some European countries, but also I would say in Biden administration uh, on. Uh, you know, possible escalation. Russians don't want to. They are escalating their war against Ukraine, as they wish. Yeah. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want this war to escalate to a you know, NATO uh, Russia conflict. Clearly, uh, so the idea that they would attack NATO or even launch nuclear weapons against NATO if we deliver certain type of, of equipment to Ukraine, uh, to me, it doesn't really. Uh, it doesn't make uh, make sense. Uh, one of the main reasons why Russians have started to, to send those signals uh, from the beginning of the war is to make sure that the NATO wouldn't intervene in the war. So, and that's, that's, that, that, that's in line with their nuclear strategy, right? Yeah. So they are not, uh, as much as they are you know, adversarial towards NATO, if uh, it's not in their interest to bring NATO into this war. We've had, uh, uh, since the, uh, the end of the Second World War and the advent of nuclear weapons, we've had this thinking the unthinkable about nuclear war. 
We've um, played the nuclear poker game in the um, Cuban crisis, 1962, the Yom Kippur crisis 1973 perhaps a few more, more crises that I, that I can remember um, very kind of hardball game of uh, um, bluff counter bluff that kind of thing are we back to that sort of way of thinking that we may have lost in the West that we need to deal with Russia very very clearly coldly and perhaps even to plan a limited strike, limited use of nuclear weapons on the mainland of Europe? Uh, I think that after the Cold War, the nuclear deterrence in NATO, but especially among European NATO members, has been marginalized. And uh, I think that a lot large part of, of political class uh, is simply not familiar with this. We are, they are being familiarized with this very quickly because of what the Russians yeah. are doing, but we still have um, more to, uh, to learn, to catch up. I think there is uh, some planning on this limited uh, use uh, being done nationally by US, France, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, as we speak, France is, is conducting uh, its, uh, one of its um, exercises, regular exercises of, of, of conducting a single um, warning strike yeah. against the adversary, if, which, if not heeded by the adversary, would, would be followed by a massive nuclear strike. So I think this, these nations understand that. In NATO, actually, we didn't have this planning for limited, for, for any use of nuclear weapons, joint use. For many years after Cold, Cold War, this has been terminated in the 90s. Uh, but at the latest Vilnius summit uh, uh, in 2023, uh, there is a passage in NATO. I I'm not going to quote it, uh, but it basically signals that we, we have returned to this joint planning. So things are changing. The question is whether things in NATO are changing fast enough and you know clearly enough uh, to send the right signal to the Russians. Let's also see what um, what. Uh, uh, conclusions about the, the success of their own nuclear coercion the Russians will, will uh, take from this ongoing war. I guess it depends from how the war ends and it's still, yes. the ball is, to, so, to say, so to speak, still in play there. Uh, if they win, they might think that in part this was thanks to their uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear threat. So the things, as, as you noted, uh, deploying, for example, US nuclear weapons in Poland under nuclear sharing would be a matter of signaling. It would also be, from military perspective, a strengthening of NATO posture, because the more uh, the more nuclear bases you have, bases with nuclear weapons, the more difficult for Russia would be to uh, take them out before we can respond yes. to them. Uh, we need to draw the conclusion, uh, not draw the, um, our discussion to a conclusion. I mean, the, uh, the, this famous doomsday clock is, seems to have always been stuck at 5 to 12 ever since I can remember. So maybe, so maybe we should, as the film says, stop worrying and learn to love the bomb. Uh, uh, maybe not, maybe not love, but understand that uh, we, as the West, we also have a nuclear deterrence. Yes. That's all we have time for today, unfortunately. So thank you, Artur Kasprzyk, for coming on to our program. Great to have you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So thanks for joining us, and join us next time for how we got here. <laughs>